Hello, and welcome to the Vibrant MD podcast, where we talk about weight loss, women's health, and food. You may be watching us on YouTube today or listening to us on the podcast, but I am thrilled to have Dr. Susie Weber today. Uh, we're talking about menopause, perimenopause, weight gain, um, weight loss, and, and some of the questions that I frequently get about menopause and perimenopause. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Weber, why don't you tell everyone about yourself? Yes, hello. I'm Dr. Suzanne Weber. I'm a gynecologist in the Denver area, and I'm also a certified menopause specialist. And um... excellent, excellent. So I wanted to start out with some questions about perimenopause and menopause. Um, so you know, it's good to know what we can know and what we can't know. And a lot of times we're in our mid forties and we say, well, I think this is perimenopause and, but there's a lot of hand waving and, and we guess ourselves about ourselves. And I want to ask you, can we know, you know, can we diagnose ourselves as perimenopause or is this kind of a hand waving kind of thing? That's a great question. I always tell patients that if we had a crystal ball and we could figure out when we were going to go through menopause, then we could look back and correlate things and realize, oh, this four to eight years, I was really in perimenopause because there really isn't a blood test that we can do for it. It's really more of a constellation of symptoms like irregular menstrual cycles, hot flashes, night sweats, weight gain, uh, sleep disturbances. And that's really you know, what we focus on is, is tackling those symptoms. Great, great. And how about for menopause, can we know we're in that and do we need a blood test? <laughs> not always. Um, if you have not had a menstrual cycle for 12 months, then you are officially, I mean, that is the moment in time when you are entering menopause. But sometimes women will have really irregular menstrual cycles or they may have uh, an IUD where they don't have menstrual cycles. And then sometimes it can be helpful to get a blood test because if you have two blood tests that are certain time apart, or you have the, a blood test and a certain set of symptoms, then you can determine that that woman is in menopause. Okay, great. And we didn't get to talk about this in advance, but um, so some non-binary people will also have menopause, correct? And some, and some trans men, all trans men will have some sort of menopause. Do we know that? Yes, you know, I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience with that. So yeah. um, I think it depends on how much ovarian suppression they would be under. But yet, if they still had ovaries, I would imagine that they would be experiencing some of those symptoms. But again, I'd have to defer to somebody with more experience with sure. Um, sure. that menopause. Thanks. Thanks. I did want to just bring it up so that people know that this is a, an issue that, um, you know, if they are a trans man or they're a non-binary person, they may want to discuss that with their doctor, right? Right. Oh, yeah. They'll have their own set of health issues that need to be addressed. Right. Definitely. True. And then I, I get questions sometimes about surgical menopause. What is, you know, usually people know if, if they've been told by their doctor, this is what you, you know, where you are now. But if you could define it for kind of everybody who doesn't maybe know that. Right. And sometimes it's very confusing because women think if they have a hysterectomy where they remove their uterus, that they're going to go into menopause. But we generally leave ovaries in women until they're older, even into their 60s sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really the removal of the ovaries and that immediate um, removal of the hormone making glands that puts you into a surgical menopause. Okay. So if people still have their ovaries, they won't have their, they won't have, but they have their uterus removed. They won't have the irregular menstruation anymore, but they might have these other symptoms. Is that correct? Right. That, that's correct. They won't have their menstrual cycle, but they will still have the hormonal fluctuations every month and they can still get ovarian cysts and they will go through a natural menopause later when their ovaries stop functioning. Okay. So they may still notice the sleep disturbances and all the other things, but. Right. Definitely. And PMS. So oh, okay. <laughs> that's a, that's a big one too. I think a lot of women think that's going to get better, but that's, that doesn't go away with the hysterectomy either. So, oh, thanks for, thanks for saying that. <laughs> okay. 
so um, there's a whole group of women who, you know, haven't had any issues with weight and maybe, maybe some things like, you know, they gained weight with a baby and they lost it or, or some life change, but overall have not had much issues with obesity or weight gain um, through their lives. But then mid forties, it starts to go up. Can you tell us a little bit more about why that happens? That's a good question. And it's, um, it's always a wonder to me why some women really experience a big fluctuation in their weight. But when we look at the times when women tend to gain the most weight, puberty, pregnancy, and then perimenopause, it's associated with hormonal fluctuations. And I've read a lot of differing theories. I've mm -hmm. seen FSH or our pituitary hormone level increasing and that correlating with weight gain. There've been some small studies around that, but nothing we can really influence. And then there's also a thought that maybe it's this increase in estrogen in the perimenopause that leads to cravings and weight gain. Mm -hmm. um, then I think there's just the general aging and genetics and lifestyle factors as well. We're frequently in our busiest times of our lives where we may not be as active. We're taking care of other people. Sleep and stress levels can affect the, the weight as well. Gotcha. So, I and wish that I could solve that problem. That would, that's the billion dollar, right, right. <laughs> billion dollar <laughs> question. People, right? Yeah. So a lot of people notice that also that they gain weight around the middle, the, the belly fat at this time. Um, do, do we know what that is? You know, I think that um, as estrogen decreases, is a lot of our risk factors become more in line with men. So we know that after menopause, women's heart disease rates start to climb. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that hormonal fluctuation also leads to us depositing more fat in our abdomen instead of our lower extremity. I mean, our lower extremities, our buttocks. Um, and the reason that's concerning, if there's a little bit of extra fat under your skin, that's more of a cosmetic issue. But if you're actually increasing your visceral fat or the fat around your organs, we know that that increases your risk of inflammatory conditions and heart disease and cancers and things like that. So it's, you know, a pretty important um, thing to pay attention to, especially if your abdominal circumference is elevated over 35 inches or something like that, 35 inches, centimeters, inches, I think. Right. And so. the... And I think people sometimes will notice that they, you know, we used to talk, and I don't know if people still talk about this actually, like a pear shape for a woman is, is just fine. But when mm -hmm. you get to more like an apple where the middle is, is getting bigger then that's a, a sign of, you know, that you need to really pay attention and, and take care of your health. Right. With right. Your weight. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. If you're an apple and, you know, and there may be something to do with testosterone as well. Our, our um, estrogen levels decline. So we get kind of an imbalance of estrogen to testosterone. And, you know, maybe that's why we see women with polycystic ovarian syndrome who have more of that um, abdominal fat and other mm -hmm. metabolic markers as well. Okay, great. Now, if you have someone, let's say someone comes to you and they're maybe 48 years old, they're noticing some more belly fat, maybe they're, maybe they've had a, their primary doctor or, you know, said, oh, your, your blood sugar is a little higher. Um, you know, what, if, if they're thinking, what are the first steps that I should take to look at my health? What, what would you suggest? I think it's always great that they've started with their primary to get their cholesterol and thyroid and other things checked to make sure that overall health is fine and there's nothing else underlying these changes. Um, but then I really think it makes sense to look at lifestyle first to see if there's been anything that's changed. And I know a lot of women say, I'm, they come in and they mention the weight gain and they say, I'm doing the same things. I'm not eating any differently. And my weight keeps increasing. And we know around menopause that we require fewer calories. I read something around 200 calories a day deficit, um, but I think it also boils down to our quality of calories. So are we getting enough fiber? Are we drinking alcohol? What are, what's the quality of our carbohydrates? Are we eating processed foods that's in, that are inflammatory? And then also looking to see if there are other problems that might be leading her to not be as active or to not have, not be making as many healthy choices. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, perimenopausal women come in and they 
their sleep is disordered. So they are, um, you know, fatigued the next day, their, their resistance to bad foods is decreased and they just don't have the energy to work out, stress, um, what's their general activity level? Are they getting strength training? So I try to look at all of these lifestyle issues and Mm -hmm. see if there's Mm -hmm. some thing that we can fix first yeah um, I think when with- I get a lot of people who um come to me for weight loss over 50 and they'll you know they don't realize that how much the sleep makes a difference you know their hormones are are quite different when they're not sleeping well and I it seems like the result of those hormone changes are that they almost you almost have a difficult time telling when you're hungry or not. Like food gets offered to you and your brain always says, yes, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you sleep well, you can kind of sit there and scan your body and say, am I hungry? Am I not hungry? And when you haven't had good sleep, the answer is always, I think I need food. When someone says, do you want food? You know what I mean? Right. Might be using it to keep yourself awake. And I, I, thought about that a lot when I used to do deliveries and I was up all night and I would think I need a, I need a cheeseburger. I was up all night. I'm burning more calories, but in fact, that's not true. You intake so many more calories when you're tired. Um, And then I try to look at a woman's sleep to see if it's disordered because of vasomotor symptoms like night sweats and things like that, because those symptoms start to emerge a lot in the perimenopause even if a woman's still having regular menstrual cycles that week or so before a period, she may really be struggling with some night sweats. And so, you know, we talk about supplements that might help that. And we talk mm-hmm. about whether she's a candidate for hormone therapy. Um, interestingly, there are some studies that show that hormone therapy can help with quality of sleep, mm-hmm. even if a woman's not having night sweats. They're small studies, of course, but there is you know, a trend toward that. Yeah. And sometimes you have to just see if, if it works for you. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely not one size fits all. So, yeah. So if I'm looking at my dinner plate then too, and I'm, you know, 40, if I'm 49 years old, I'm looking at my dinner plate and I think I need to, you know, I probably need to eat a little bit less or I, I shouldn't even say I need to eat a little bit less. I don't need as much as I used to. So what should I prioritize when I'm looking at my plate? What do I want to put on there at dinner time? Right. That's a great question. I recommend really increasing fiber, um, 25, mm-hmm. 35 grams minimum a day. I think we need to get things that are more filling, lean proteins and um, more protein. So in general, maybe about a gram per kilogram or more a day if somebody, depending on how active a woman is, I think we definitely need more protein at this time in our life. And I think just more lean, um, like I said, lean protein, but also vegetables, complex carbohydrates. I think it's really hard to go completely no carbohydrate for a lot of women, but if you're making good choices, getting beans, you know, flaxseed, all of those things, that's what I usually recommend and avoiding a minimizing or avoiding alcohol, because for some women, the alcohol can really affect them and have them hold on to weight. I think can it really affect them hormonally. It affects their sleep quality, their night sweats, um, and also decreases your inhibition. You may tend to eat a little bit more, pick a little bit more, you know, if I'm drinking a glass of wine, making dinner, I'm like, yeah, snacking, snacking <laughs> while I'm cooking. So Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific point. Well, thank you so much for this information. That's super helpful. And I hope that the audience is, you know, had some take home points for things that they can try right away at home. Uh, Think about their sleep, think about what they might eat, you know, take a look at alcohol for sure. Really think about that and experiment with some things, right? I I do get people who say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to quit alcohol. And I say, that's fine do you want to experiment with less alcohol or an event without alcohol or a meal without alcohol um, and see what you like, you know, because I think you're right. It's a, it's a definitely an issue that needs to be looked at it at this age for weight and for health and sleep. And right. 
Well, thank you so much for all this information. I'm sure that there are people in the audience who would like to contact or to connect with you more. Um, and you have an online presence. So could you tell us a little bit about how people can connect with you? Sure, sure. I have a website, healthiermenopause.com, where I blog and try to offer unbiased educational resources about perimenopause and menopause. And I also do some one-on-one -on -one consulting or coaching. Um, also on um, Facebook as Menopause MD, Instagram and TikTok as Healthier Menopause. I post some informative videos, hopefully informative. So, and I'm also an uh, employed physician in the South Denver area. So people can find me if they wanted to work with me as a patient. Great, thank you. I will make sure we put your social media handles in the show notes. So if people wanna go there, they can find you also easily there. And thank you again. Thank you so much. So I wanna let people know that I am Dr. Heather Awad, your host, and I do help professional women over age 50 lose weight. Uh, for the last time, we only go for permanent weight loss. So please feel free to reach out to me on social media with a message. Um, and I would be glad to talk to you about what I can do to help you as well. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you.